My name is Brenda Hyatt, and I live on the eastern end of Hampshire County. And this church is my church. It's the one I grew up in as a child. I still attend it today. And I am the caretaker of Cape and Chapel. So let me take you on a trip to Cape and Chapel Church. The church is located in the eastern end of Hampshire County, near the Virginia State Line. In Cape and Bridge, on the eastern side of Cape and River, you will turn off Route 50 onto Christian Church Road, which is located between Giffen Funeral Home and Del Ponte Mexican Restaurant. Drive two miles south and you will see Cape and Chapel and its cemetery on the left, sitting on a little knoll surrounded by pastures. Let's stop and visit this small, unpretentious structure. The exact date of Cape and Chapel's origin is lost in the past. We do not know for certain when the church was constructed, nor do we know whose hands built it. Oral history gives the date as 1756, when it was organized as a Baptist church. Early settlers gathered under a larger oak tree on this spot for religious purposes. As deaths occurred on the frontier, a burial spot was needed and a church was built. I believe the cemetery is older than the church itself. It was a simple log structure with a dirt floor and benches for seating. Later, the cemetery was defined by a wrought iron fence and the church improved with pine floors, pews, and kerosene lighting. The log exterior was covered with white clapboarding. The observant eye will note the positioning of the first row of tombstones to the right of the gate. The headstones are facing east, flush against the fence, while others are facing west, indicating burials outside the fence. As we open the large heavy door, we can see four glass panes above the door and a strip of intricate dental molding. Our eyes fall to the bronze plaque on the door. This plaque reads, Cape and Chapel. This property is listed on the National Register of Historic Places by the United States Department of the Interior, circa 1852. This date is the first recorded written date of the existing church. At the courthouse is a very old deed stating that Joseph Pugh in 1852 granted property to church trustees for the creation of a graveyard and for a house for the public worship of Almighty God for the use of all Orthodox Christians. Historic West Virginia states the church building is a significant example of the region's early religious architecture, exhibiting log construction techniques, as well as the simple design and form common to early ecclesiastical buildings. The Baptists are recognized as being the first to bring God's message to this then remote area. Reverend Shubal Cerns and the Reverend Daniel Morgan established a church near Cape and Bridge in 1755. This was most probably the location. Stones in the first row of the cemetery plainly state the burials were members of the Old Baptist Church. As we step inside, we travel back in time. We observe gleaming wide yellow pine flooring and pews. Four large windows with exterior shutters let in light and air. Looking closely, we can see air bubbles and wavy lines in the glass. A small square room with a raised pulpit, also of yellow pine, holds a Bible of great age. The mantel above is also decorated with the same dental molding, and the ledge above holds a water pitcher and a cut glass cruet and two worn offering baskets. On each side of the pulpit is a small shelf holding an antique kerosene lamp. The room feels rather small, but will hold up to 85 worshipers. When the sun is shining, a soft golden glow falls over the pews, 
And if you shut your eyes, you can feel the presence of God and the worshipers of former generations. It is here that I come when I'm worried or troubled or upset. I am always renewed. The Bible, laying on the pulpit, was published in 1896 by A.J. Holman and Company of 1222 Arch Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It contains the Old Testament and the New Testament. And sandwiched between the two are the 14 books of the Bible, often referred to as the Lost Books, the Apocrypha. The Bible was restored on January the 4th, 1992 by Mount Pleasant Bookbinders in Augusta, West Virginia. The gigantic oak tree which sheltered many congregations and the church itself was struck by lightning in the early summer of 1984, no less than four times. A large limb fell on the cemetery fence, damaging it and also some headstones. Reluctantly, the trustees decided to remove the tree. Warren Dulier, the editor of the West Virginia Advocate, was on the site at the time. He published an article about the tree with photos in his paper. A blue spruce tree was planted to replace it, and after attaining maturity, a disease affected it, and again the tree was removed in 2013. Although it has been 50 years since the removal of the oak tree, a few remnants of the stump remain. A wood stove provided heat during church services with the pipe going up through the chimney ceiling. Mr. Mervyn Wolford was the caretaker at the time. He habitually built a fire early on Sunday morning as he traveled to Cape and Bridge where he owned and operated Wolford's Grocery. By 2 p.m. when services were held, the church interior was warm and comfortable. During the time he was absent, creosote buildup in the pipe caught fire, damaging the ceiling and burning a hole in the floor. The fire was discovered and extinguished. Burn marks and the floor repair are plainly visible. At that time, Mervyn Warford jacked up the church and placed it on a block foundation, installed a new ceiling, and excavated space under the church for an oil furnace, which is still in use today. His contributions were major in preserving the chapel for future generations to enjoy. Caretakers at the chapel during my lifetime were Harrison Oates, my grandfather, Ellis and Edith Haynes, Mervyn Wolford, and myself. Mr. Wolford died in December of 1982, and I followed in my grandfather's footsteps by assuming the role of caretaker. The interior of the church was renovated during the late 80s and early 90s after I accepted the responsibility of caring for the chapel. We had little funds to start with. But as we began, money began to appear from the community, and the labor of love continued. George Brill of Yellow Springs spent many hours working there and tutoring us in removing wallpaper and stripping paint. The trim wood, wainscoting, and pews were covered with an old-time enamel, extremely hard to remove. Roger Hahn installed new electrical wiring, bringing everything up to code, and donating his work. The cemetery also needed attention. Additional land was purchased for more burial plots and the work continued. In 2017, a second renovation was done by Rick and Bobby Ark of RGA Builders here in Romney. Wallpaper was stripped and restoration and painting were done by them. Flags and new pew cushions were installed with funds from a church-sponsored soup sale. Light filtering blinds were also purchased. The worker from Next Day Blinds was astounded to find all four windows were level and plumb. The chapel was crowned with a new metal roof in 2016 by Jim Pan on Roofing of Augusta. 
The exterior of the church was repainted in 2017 by Anthony Warford. The new roof and exterior painting were done using funds donated at her death from the estate of Virginia Nixon Krim. A large handcrafted lighted cross was given to the chapel by George, his nickname Buddy, Stickman and his wife Dawn. Buddy installed it on the side of the church facing the road where it served as a reminder of God's light to the passerby. Future Penny includes the sandblasting and painting of the Rod Arm Cemetery fence as funding becomes available. Let's visit the cemetery and discover some of its secrets. Just inside the small gate near the church door on your right stands a tall shaft of a tombstone. It resembles a miniature Washington monument. The name on the stone identifies the spot as a burial place of Captain David Pugh and his family. The captain was born in Cape and Bridge on February the 8th, 1806. His death occurred on January 29th, 1899. He is descended from the first Robert Pugh to settle here and was a dominant figure in the church's history. The captain married three times. First to Mary W. Kenneford in 1830. Secondly to Jane Creswell in 1835. And last to Elizabeth A. Garvin, born February 3, 1820, died May 14, 1900. He was a member of the Virginia State Legislature in 1841 and a friend and visitor to the White House during Andrew Jackson's tenure. He was a signer of the document of secession at the beginning of the Civil War. Max von Swisher's <coughs> History of Hampshire County states, Captain David Pugh of Cabin District is the possessor of a quill pen with which Virginia's ordinance of secession was signed. It was never used afterwards and the dried ink is still on it. A local legend involving the captain is recounted in Willard Wirtz's book, Cape and Valley Sampler. Captain David and a companion, Samuel Davis, spoke their minds to a group of Union soldiers after the war. The soldiers demanded the two men take the oath of allegiance to the United States. After refusing, they were taken to Winchester and jailed. They held out for several days on nothing but bread and water, but finally signing the oath and bargaining to get their horses back, they returned home. In later years, the captain continued to be a public figure, and he served as sheriff in his home county of Hampshire. His home is located on River Road, where it intersects with Hooks Mill Road and is also on the National Historic Register. He became the owner of Bubbling Springs after the Kale family and owned it until his death. He also donated the lumber used to build the first structure housing the Timber Ridge Christian Church, for which the road is named. The structure was replaced by a brick one after a fire. Over the curve of the ground, down from Captain David's last resting spot, is a small white marble stone marking the burial site of Captain William Nixon, the oldest American veteran buried in the cemetery. William, along with other young neighbors, served an enlistment in the War of 1812 in nearby Ohio. He was a captain in the Virginia militia and like all Southern men, proudly carried this title all his days. It appears on his tombstone. When his mother-in-law, Elizabeth Lyons Cotty, died, he established a cemetery on his land near his residence. In later years, he built Cape and Chapel, adjoining the cemetery. His funeral services were held in the chapel. Here lie his children and spouses, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The allied families of the Nixons and Cottys lie here also. Joseph Cackley was a local man who fought for the South, as so many did. He migrated to Kansas after the war. 
In the January of 1904, he returned to his former home to visit family. He became ill, died, and was buried at Cape and Chapel. Surviving members of his old Confederate brigade, Turner Ashby's Black Horse Unit, attended his burial at the chapel, riding their black mounts. The older tombstones read like a who's who of the early settlers of Hampshire County and the Cape and River Valley. The oldest dated stone in the cemetery is that of Elizabeth Cotty, wife of David Cotty, a descendant of early pioneer settler James Cotty of Cotty's Castle fame. Earlier burials were marked with field stone with no engraved dates. Over the years when mowing was done by hand, they disappeared or were removed to accommodate mowing. There is a black section in the cemetery containing many unmarked graves. One special stone belongs to Black Mary. She was a slave belonging to Samuel Cooper's wife, Martha. This is the same Samuel Cooper who built Moss Rock Inn and also the structure which housed Cooper's store and the Cape and Bridge Post Office. Cooper Mountain is named for his family. Samuel Cooper was the youngest member of his family. He was born in 1824 to Adam and Catherine Kurtz Cooper. Both schools and books were scarce when he was a lad. Saving his money, he invested it in books, becoming a teacher before the age of 20. He taught school in winter and continued his education in the, in the summers. In 1851, he was nominated for county surveyor. He was a justice of the peace, a member of the county court, and the presiding officer of the Capon District Board of Education. He also served as sheriff of Hampshire County. He enlisted in the Confederate service on June 13, 1861, in Frederick County, Virginia, and served in the 51st Virginia Militia, Company G. In 1866, Colonel Cooper was elected to the West Virginia State Legislature with Henry G. Davis, who was later a U.S. Senator as his colleague. They were Hampshire County's first representatives after the war. As a Democrat, he was in the minority side of the legislature, but his conduct won for him the respect and confidence and esteem of his party and state. He owned and operated Cooper's store in Cape and Bridge for many years. He donated land for the Presbyterian Church, which is now the Cape and Bridge Ruiton Community Center. He gave liberally to the Methodist Church as well, donating organs and silver communion sets to both churches. He married Martha Jane Nixon, and they lived at Moss Rock Inn. He and Martha are interred at Cape and Chapel, taking with him a golden key which went to the post office. Many years later, a family member wrote to Miss Gertrude Ward, who is a local Cooper descendant, and returned the key to her. Gertrude donated the key to the Hort Historical Society. It is now part of the post office display in the museum which adjoins the Cape and Bridge Library. Just across Route 50 stands Fry's Inn, owned and run by Jenny Fry and her son Mayo. Virginia L. Fry was born on August the 10th, 1854. She recalled as a child seeing Stonewall Jackson and his men in prayer under the walnut tree across the road during the Civil War. She died at the age of 97 on December the 28th, 1951. The tree was removed when the Cape and Bridge Library was built. The story inspired a painting by a local artist, Laura Seabright. It is entitled Confederate Spirits Return. A beautifully framed print, which was given by Laura Birchwood, hangs on a wall at the chapel. Confederate Spirits Return prints were made and sold as a fundraiser 
by the library and are still available today. One of the first known ministers at Cape and Chapel was Elder John Monroe, who was also a doctor. He came to Hampshire County from Fauquier County, Virginia, where he is credited with laying out the town of Marshall. Formerly, it was called New Salem. When the town of Marshall celebrated its 250th birthday, a delegation from that town visited his gravesite, placing a large wreath and a Scottish plaid on his stone. Elder Monroe is known to have a warm, friendly, and dignified manner. As a physician, he had been in extensive practice and was viewed as a man of skill. Dr. John Monroe died at his son's home on the Cape and River in Hampshire County on August 17, 1824, and was buried with his wife at his side in Cape and Chapel Cemetery. His descendants remained in Hampshire County. After the Baptist congregation disbanded, the Methodists began using the church and cemetery sometime during the latter 1800s. The church is considered to be one of the oldest known structures to have continuous services in Hampshire County. The cemetery is a final resting place for other brave Americans. 24 local Confederate soldiers, 17 other veterans from World Wars I and II, and the Korean conflict are at rest in the cemetery. Our American flag waves proudly over them all. Other names come to mind, too numerous to mention. Edwards, Pews, Beals, Fries, Offutts, Nixons, Hamiltons, and many more. From the days when there was no bridge across Cape and River, only the ferry, this house of worshipers and the cemetery have been there, a witness to God's call to our pioneer settlers and families and to each and every one of us today. Currently, Cape and Chapel is the smallest church on the Cape and Bridge charge, both in membership and actual size, and our pastor is Alana McGuinn. For the first time in many, many years, we have weekly services, and our door is an open invitation for anyone. We have seven members, all women, ranging in age from 94 to 58. At one time, we were down to three members. Each of us is using our God-given talents in service to the Lord. We have open hearts and willing hands to reach out and spread God's message of salvation. Our outreach services include the following. A prayer shawl and bereavement blanket ministry, cookie plates, a plate of goodies to enjoy and pass along to anyone who comes to mind. A prayer line, a local call at 304-856-1040. A daily devotion to lift spirits and help us stay centered. And an opportunity to request prayer for troubles, troubled souls. Adopt a family, assisting families who are in need regular contributions to the local food pantry, the fifth congregation. Cards, letters, and devotions are sent to the elderly and shut-ins who are physically unable to drive or attend church functions. Hair care services for the elderly and shut-ins in our area when needed. For many years, it has been a tradition to place a lighted garland along the cemetery fence and to decorate the chapel's interior for the annual Christmas Eve candlelight service held on December the 24th at 7 p.m. The Christmas Eve offering is poured back into the community where it is needed. Last year, the offering went to Matthew's Gift, which is a nonprofit organization set up by one of our church members in memory of her son. It provides breakfast for the elderly and needy in Hampshire County. And I am told that Matthew Skiff delivered 70 breakfasts today to Hampshire County folks. Bud Boyce created a wooden cross for each church on the charge. 
Christy painted the leaves green on our cross to symbolize that Cape and Chapel is a church rooted in the past, but alive and growing with a purpose in today's world. Thank you. And if you have any questions, now is the time. <laughs> and, and I'm sure Christy can... Thank you. And I'm sure Christy can pull up pictures if there's if you, you want to have another look at them. Uh, when we were doing the first uh, church restoration, the two photos there that had the plastic bags over the church, we had discovered when we started that we had pine borers in the church. And we had to have uh, the exterminators come up from Winchester, I believe Paramount. And they called in two specialists from Arlington, and they uh, shot some kind of gas in there and enclosed it all in those plastic bags. And we did not have, posted a guard because you couldn't enter the church for 24 hours. And we didn't have a fly, a spider, any kind of insect <laughs> for three to five years after that. <laughs> Any questions? Um, there was a <coughs> picture of the store in Cape and Bridge. Did we see that yeah. originally? That's, that's in the John Monroe section. The store, or, or Colonel Cooper section. Now. Christy, it's back toward the, just look through until you come to it. There we go. Yeah. Right there. Do you have any idea of the date of the one on the left? You see, it looks like cars. It's early cars. This is the same mm -hmm. building. So. That one is uh, 18, it says 1854 on the left side. That picture's been in the Hampshire Review before, Charlie. Which store is that? It's uh, Cooper store. It's currently closed. That, it looks, it, uh, the building on the right is the same building. Uh, it is now closed. It belongs to Tommy Kipps, I believe, in Cape and Bridge, and he also owns Fry's Inn. The post office used to be on the end of this building, on the left side, and the uh, store was on the right. So the, the golden key went to that post office door. Is that the one that's right next to the bridge? The bridge. Mm -hmm. Bridge, okay. Yes. I know what you're talking about. And uh, River Road is, you know, right there at the end of the store if you turn and go up in. Yes. Now there's also a picture of a covered bridge. Yes. This has been puzzling me for some time. You tell me what you know about that. Okay. There, oh, that was back one, Christy. Mm -hmm. that, that, that picture originated with Wanda Riley and her husband Hollis. Uh, and Hollis, his mother was a Monroe. He's a Monroe descendant. He passed away a few years ago. But uh, Wanda gave me that picture, and it has since been copied many times. That is the first bridge, the covered bridge that covered Cape and Bridge. And there's a lady in the buggy. Wanda said she didn't, wasn't sure which one it was, but it's a Monroe descendant. It was one of Hollis's relatives. And of course, the second bridge, that the other bridge is the second bridge that crossed the river after the covered bridge was torn down. Did that chapel have a basement? There were four. Bridges. There are two more, and one of them, of course, is the current one. Did the chapel have a basement? Have a basement? Pardon? Did that chapel have a basement? No. No. No, it, it, it just had a dirt crawl space, and Mr. Warford, when he decided to install that furnace, he dug out a little room, a little space just for the furnace. And that furnace was secondhand, Mike, when he bought it. And we're still using it today. <laughs> and that was back in the eight, uh, yeah, no, no, it was seventies, late seventies. So the walls had wallpaper on them. Yes. Like how many layers? Uh, Joyce, do you remember how many layers? Of Rick? Yeah, no, that's Rick. How yeah, many? No, wall. but Rick wasn't there when we took off the first wallpaper. Oh. No, I don't remember. I'd, I'd say at least four, and underneath it was that old time. Horsehair plaster. Right. Cracks. With lots of cracks. And that's not there anymore either? 
Well, we put wallpaper back at that time, because that was the first renovation. And then when um, RGA Builders worked on it in uh, 2016 and 17, uh, they took the old wallpaper off and worked on the horsehair plaster, creating beautiful smooth walls, no sign of any cracks, and uh, it's now painted. <laughs> What, what is the date of the deed for the property? The deed uh, in, uh, is 1852. That's why the plaque says 1852. That's the first written recorded date. But other information, well, the stones in the cemetery are older than, way older than that. So the cemetery was there before the church, and the church was built. And... Uh, the little brown book called Historic Romney, uh, I don't know whether, are you familiar with that, Charlie? It gives the date as 1756 when the Baptist organized a church near Cape and Bridge. And that doesn't mean that the structure was there at that time, but the people were already meeting under that big oak tree. Now, um, ask our expert on building back here, horse hair plaster. Mm -hmm. Do we have years for that? I don't really. Um, hard to say. Um, <laughs> we went to Pompeii, okay, <laughs> you know, and they had plaster there. Whether there was horsehair in there, I mean, this, you know, Pompeii, what, around the turn, around zero, right? <laughs> so plaster has existed for a long period of time. I'm sure they added some kind of hair to it as a binder. Yeah. I, mean, I just wonder, have you all, when you did the renovation, did you try to determine the age of the structure? If you mean, did we have a professional come in and try to date it? The answer is no. <laughs> you can date the wood. Dendrochronology. You can actually date that wood. We, we don't. We don't have the, the timeline for it. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know the, the big oak tree. They they uh, counted the rings on it. Right. And they figured that it was at least 300 years old, and that was in 1984. Yeah, that's wow. Uh, some of the wood made its way into the hands of people in the neighborhood. I know my uncle Russell, uh, who d does did woodworking, uh, created a couple tables from some of the wood, uh, and I have an ink pen that was made by George Brill uh, from that wood. So this was a log structure. Yes, it has white clapboarding on it. Uh, Christy, you have. Can you go back to that photo where it shows the log under the edge of that white clapboarding? Right, right there. Can you see the log? And then, of course, when you go down underneath the church to turn the furnace on, as I do, you you know you, you can, you can see. see all that. How do you get to that? How, how do you get to that? Inside or outside? Outside. 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 And we don't have any, uh, we turn the furnace off to conserve fuel. Uh, we only turn it on in time to warm up the church for services in cold weather. You, you mentioned that the services were at 2 in the afternoon back then, yes. are they still at 2 in the afternoon? No, they're at 1 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it used to be in the summers, uh, we would have services at 7 in the evening, and then uh, in the wintertime, because of the weather, we'd have it at 2 in the afternoon. But uh, all that changed when we were able to have services every Sunday. 1 o'clock was uh, the best time, because our pastor serves four churches. So that works with her schedule. They're all Methodist churches. And we have Pastor McGuinn with us today. She's sitting in the back there. She and one and our oldest member. Oh, welcome. I believe you had a question. Yes, I did, but um, the uh, pictures with the bridges um, yes. The, do you know the dates on, like, the covered bridge and then the other, and the other one? And I was wondering, because Jay mentioned too, too, that other picture, was that a flood 
picture? Yes. And it uh, looked like there were a lot of people on the bridge yes. too. There were they, 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 there must have been high water that day, or there was some reason they were standing on it. Yeah, I think the, like really that high. I think that's around nineteen. That's on a postcard. I don't, I don't know whether it'll show up on the picture or not, but the date's on there. I've got uh, photos of all four of the bridges. Yeah, there was a 1936 flood, a 1924 flood. So and one of the... Um, Looks pretty high. It's down there in the lower right corner. Oh. But one of the... Uh, Can you blow it up? Floods we have, the, the, one of the pictures of Moss Rock Inn, uh, when you look at it, you, I took that after the flood, after the water went down, they, every, all the bushes and everything has a muddy coating because when the river gets above the level of Dillon's Run, it backs up in that creek and fills that, the river actually, the creek runs backwards at that time. <laughs> How about the uh, the covered bridge? Do you, you, what would the date would be the date on that? Uh, I think it was built around 1836. So it's That's a great picture. It is. It shows the interior. There are uh, some other pictures around showing the exterior, but they're uh, very faded. Wait a minute, this is. Uh, What's it say? March 27th. Okay. Uh, I think is it it's 1919. 1919? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, you're right. It's 1913. 1913? Yeah. The next bridge after that one was a metal bridge that had two arches, and then the current bridge, which is there today. I wanted to talk to you about our um, mission projects. We have a group that meets every Monday, and they knit or crochet, and if you don't know how to do either one, we'll teach you. <laughs> this is one of our prayer shawls that we send out to anyone who needs cheering up or is ill in the hospital or whatever. That concludes my presentation, so uh, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. And Brenda has been a caretaker for how long? Well, since Mr. Wolford died in 82. So you probably had a lot of people mention things to you, too. And that's uh, over the years, uh, the uh, Confederate soldier, the Joseph Cacklin, uh, after the war, so many of our ex-soldiers migrated because the climate here was not very healthy for Confederate soldiers, as Captain David Pugh's story illustrates that. And so they went west, and uh, Joseph Cackley actually founded a town in Kansas and became a very wealthy man. Uh, the lady in one of the pictures with the Confederate reenactors was a uh, descendant of his, and when we were installing the Orange Cross on his grave, she came in that year, and that's how we found out about him and what unit he belonged to. Before that, we had no idea he was a military person. Well, and that's, that, that's the kind of networking that you need to yes. find out a little bit more. Kansas was mentioned in some of where some of the Washingtons moved, too. So, you know, that's yeah. fascinating. I hadn't heard about the the health of the area and why people might move yeah. west. west. Well, I appreciate Brenda helping us with this because we have so many people who are interested in history and um, you know it. So, well, we thank you for sharing certain that. things. I've been a lifelong resident of Hampshire County. I was born at home just a about a mile from Cape and Chapel in the farmhouse, and old Doc Easton from Romney made house calls. He delivered all of us except for my youngest sister. She was born in a hospital. <laughs> I have, I have uh, three other siblings besides Joyce and myself, so there were five of us all together. 
But you're the only one who's the caretaker on. Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, my uh, great grandfather, Daniel Oates, had a blacksmith shop here in Ron. He and uh, actually Dan Oates and I share the same great grandfather. And where was that black shop? It was on Gravel Lane. Lane. And Norwood there told me that he remembers visiting Daniel there a few times because Norwood's a cousin. <laughs> Norwood has an amazing memory and we have to just, he's the, he's the one to ask about so many things here, so yes. We're going to get you back sometime. He's done two of these Romney on the Menus. Let me tell you who's coming up next. Um, October we have Dale Brady who has been working on, <laughs> talk about going down rabbit holes. She started doing a walking tour and has just you know, every time you find out more information about this building and that building, and it's just taken her so so many different places. You have to keep going back and rewriting when we, every new piece of information. So she's going to give us a little bit of a, an idea of what she's working on, and I'm hoping that people will come at bearing gifts for her of resources to have a little bit more information about some of she's doing around me, although she's interested in much more, so if you have other things that would be great. Um, in November we've got Jane McBride. Now I haven't pinned her down on exactly what she's going to talk about. So it could be her place down there. Jane McBride. Jane? Well she'll talk. It will be fascinating whatever it is. We take December off. Um, Dale uh, David Pancake, Robin Pancake are going to get together and do a talk about the Indian site that was uncovered after the 85 flood and the reburial of the, was it the Shenandoah? Susquehanna. Susquehanna mm -hmm. Indians. Um, Susquehanna. And I haven't pinned them down exactly on one, what month, but you know, in January and February, it's kind of hard to know what the weather will be, but uh, we'll get them coming in. And if you know anybody else who's willing to share some history, you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with a pair of somebody else. We would love to. I let me know. When's Jane coming? November. It's always the third Friday of the month. This is when we have this building.